it will make. Okay. So, so as Anna mentioned, our um, talk is going to be about the OER in Spanish, a service a service learning multidisciplinary initiative. Um, that we started at USC in um, 2012 that has evolved into a different project. And we will explain why and how we have been developing this um, service learning program and how it expanded into our open educational resource. So we're gonna tell you a little bit about the original program, how we adapted to the online environment, what COVID, um, got to us, um, how we expanded the scope later on by creating um, a website and what our future goals are gonna be um, in the future, basically. <laughs> Here we are. So, Liana. Yes, thank you. So our initial project, Lingua Franca, was launched in 2013 and experience showed that um, it helps students to reflect on their involvement and understand the course content better and engage with the communities better and in a more meaningful way as they participate in our programs. So Lingua Franca then evolved into Spanish brigades and all these programs eventually expanded and evolved under the umbrella of Feliz en Español. Mercedes? As Liana mentioned, Lingua Franca developed into three different programs. We had um, a collaboration with an elementary school charter school, Los Feliz Charter School for the Arts, where our students went in during after school program to teach the kids uh, Spanish. Then we had a collaboration with USC Hybrid High, uh, where students went into the regular classroom and helped instructors and taught the kids, um, the high school students Spanish. And then the last program we developed uh, was um, a collaboration with John Muir, who is also an elementary school, but this is a bilingual program. And what we were doing in that uh, particular case is to go into the classroom, mostly into kindergarten, first grade, and help in the class because instructors at that level had a huge number of students that spoke Spanish at home in the same classroom with students that were learning Spanish for the first time. So we were there to support the instructors and help them in, in that transition of learning Spanish. The programs, ooh, sorry. So the program um, achieves an academic goal, 50% uh, of the all requirement of our classes either in the form of presentations or portfolios for in Spanish and intermediate and advanced levels can be substituted with the participation in this project. Um, where students um, go into the classroom, but they also reflect on by the, what they do by writing assignments. They do later on in-class presentation for the, to the rest of the classmates. And then at the end of the program, they uh, participate in voluntary surveys that help us understand how the program is going and improve it if possible. Um, there's a community engagement where we have on one side or students, but also the children that are receiving um, the Spanish classrooms, the, the staff of the schools where we participate and help, and also the parents of those kids that are involved in, in the program, uh, which has been really uh, tying a collaboration between us, the professors at USC, the educators at the schools, and the students both at USC at the schools that we um, were going to. In practice, the program had first an orientation. Um, Feliz en Español was presented in our regular classrooms. Um, our students will go, as I mentioned, and would teach in-person classes. They will afterwards reflect and do in-class presentation to our USC Spanish students, and they would write reflections. Um, the assessment of the students' performance was all based on teaching evaluations that we had created rubrics for. So we would evaluate both the class presentations and we will uh, also evaluate the written reflections. And as I said, at the end, uh, students were given uh, an anonymous survey and so they could tell us what they thought about the program. And the same was done uh, to parents and students at the schools. Okay. 
Um, when COVID hit, obviously we were no longer able to go in person into the schools, so we had to restructure the programs. Um, so we had to uh, alter the programs a little bit to shift to the online environment. So Merch, you wanna go to the next slide? Um, in order to streamline the process, we put all three of our programs under the umbrella of one program called Feliza en la Comunidad. Um, this was kind of to help us pool resources and especially to streamline the evaluation process and the selection process of the, of the students into each um, separate program. Um, then, oh, oh, continue, <laughs> thank you. Um, in practice, what did this look like? So once we had selected students, we had one orientation, which we would divide into breakout rooms via Zoom to discuss um, what each group would be doing. Um, the actual work itself that the students would be doing changed a little bit in that some students were able to prepare classes to be taught in Spanish via Zoom in the normal classroom hours of our um, sites that we were working with, whereas others created uh, supplemental Spanish activities um, that were asynchronous that the uh, site teachers could use um, whenever they deemed it necessary. Um, assessment changed a little bit, but honestly, not that much. So we uh, had two different um, rubrics for grading synchronous versus asynchronous materials. And then uh, in order to debrief, we had um, two large Zoom sessions where all of the students uh, would get together and they would talk about their experiences and we'd reflect on them in Spanish. In terms of assessing the program, that, oh, that remained the same. We still had the anonymous, anonymous surveys that everyone would fill out in order to assess the program. Um, the program benefits remained the same. Um, and the uh, site teachers were particularly excited as they were, you know, to put it mildly, very stressed out over, over the circumstances and scrambling to get materials together and scrambling to find a way to teach in this new environment. So to have uh, us and our students come in and help out and provide some support for them and provide uh, digital online materials that they were able to use was really helpful because it was one less thing that they had to do. Um, and it, it, you know, continued um, to create this partnership and this collaboration and this feeling of community, which is also particularly helpful with our high school students in that they still got to engage with college students, which not only helped them with their Spanish, but also kind of conceptualizing themselves going uh, to college, which was uh, always very helpful. Um, and then for our students at USC, um, it really you know, helped them a lot in numerous ways, um, particularly in the ability to gain confidence uh, in using their Spanish out in the real world and applying it in real practice. Um, but also in this idea of feeling connected to community, particularly during COVID when there was a lot of feeling of isolation going around. So this idea of being able to connect to the community without having to um, you know, risk any health or safety was also uh, very important. So as we were collecting all of these digital materials now, um, we thought it would be a really good idea to collect them all and to put them in one place um, as an OER to create a repository for all of these activities so that our instructors and students would be able to use them, um, you know, far into the future. Um, there was a need for this, obviously, and uh, you know, my first job uh, out of college was teaching middle school, and my mentor teacher told me all teachers should learn how to beg, borrow, and steal, and don't reinvent the wheel. So um, to me, this really spoke to that here. We've already done the work uh, to allow these teachers to be, continue to access it um, and to adjust the activities to their needs as they continue on into the future. Our first attempt to centralize our resources and open them to all was this website, oerspanish.org, where we placed materials created by USC faculty. And as you can see here, these are open educational resources still available on that website. And they are organized by um, um, educational goals, grammar structures, level, and so on. This project was a collaboration only by USC professors, but eventually this evolved into another project where we partnered with USC Viterbi. Jamie? 
Yes. Yeah. So obviously we are uh, strong believers in ex experiential learning and service learning. Um, and so we figured um, if we wanted to really turn our materials into a usable OER, we certainly do not have the technical skills to be able to do that. So we were trying to figure out a way to get that done. And it seemed a logical um, next step to create another experiential learning project. So we partnered with our um, School of Engineering with a uh, capstone computer science class for seniors. And one of their projects was to help us out um, to create our website. Um, so you have the name of the professor, Jeffrey Miller, who is no longer um, at USC, but he was at that time. And the, uh, the students that we worked with there who built our new website. So the final result, as you can see, is called OER in Spanish, um, and it's a, a place where we have collected all the repository activities that our students created, and as Liana mentioned, those that the faculty had created. So in that sense, it's unique because it's combining both the work of professors and students on the same website, and it's a complete searchable website. You can type um, the name um, of whatever topic you want to do. And you can choose what kind of technology you would like to find. If you want to have a video or peer deck to use in your class, if you want a Google document or Quizlet, um, you can select by basic or intermediate or advanced level. And then, oops, and then we can also select what kind of uh, abilities you want to develop with your students. If you want to do an audio or you want to do a conversation activity, and escritura. So in this example, we type on the top like animals for basic level and with a comprehension um, uh, audio activity. And you have, it leads you to an activity created by one of our students, the USC, so we credit our students, uh, and a link with a video to, that she created. And, and an example you can, you can see of a more advanced activity created in this case by a professor at USC. Um, it was about art at an intermediate level, and we didn't select it what kind of abilities we wanted to work, but it takes you to two activities with a Mexican artist uh, in Los Angeles or uh, a session of, um, this was a specific standard LA time, was a, a, a series of shows that happened in LA uh, over a period of six months. So we created an activity um, that will take us through different of those exhibits and work that could be done with those exhibits. Um, the future goals we have right now is expanding the database. So now that it is created and uh, for the last four semesters, we have been creating more activities that now we need to add to this website. And we're trying to figure out who's gonna help us now, how is the next step and how are we gonna manage the content? We also have realized that there are a couple of things that we can tweak in our website and we can improve. Uh, we are always looking for new collaborations, new schools, new students that want to be parting, parting and collaborating with us. Um, and we're also trying to find how we're going to keep finding funding to keep this going and, and you make it more, more interested and more elaborating. Um, I think we have done it, less than 50 minutes. <laughs> if anyone has questions, uh, please, this would be the moment too. Um, I will also share on the chat the, the link um, to, the, to the website so people can, can take a look if they want. Okay, that's it, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. So yes, we have the next couple minutes for Q&A. Um, feel free to drop your question in the chat and I can always read it out or if you wanna unmute yourself and speak, go right ahead. And yes, uh, that, that link is in the chat if anybody would like to go ahead and check. I have a question. Um, so your, your, your website um, is sharing resources that were developed by um, faculty and students, I guess, at USC. Um, is there any interest in opening up to the larger community and having it be a larger repository for other schools to contribute to? Yes, actually one of the things that happened uh, 
was that one of the schools we collaborate with, um, Large Room Charter School, which is the last addition to the list of schools that we collaborated with. Um, some of the students in the IP program, so the activities that our students were doing, and they decided that they wanted to help too. And at that point, um, high school students were really looking for possibilities for volunteering because we are in the middle of COVID. They cannot go out. They're thinking about applying to colleges, right? And there isn't that many options for them. So we welcomed them. And actually, some of the activities that we're planning on adding up to the website that we created are coming from those high school students in the AP Spanish class. So yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. If anybody thinks of a question, um, we'll have another minute or so of setting up for our next presenter. Um, if everyone, I always like to use the reactions button with, uh, with Zoom and give a round of applause. It's always nice to do that for every presentation. So thank you so much. Um, we'll go ahead and get set up for our next presentation and then we'll dive back in in about just one minute. Okay. So I am gonna pop. Okay, so we are all good. Uh, so welcome back everybody. We have our second presentation now by Al-Kasim Hamasu Abdu. His presentation will be on the hosting and delivering of open educational resources by the Nigerian universities. So it'll be a 15 minute presentation followed by five minutes of Q and A. Okay. Are you ready to come? May I come in? Yes, Hello? yes, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, as you can see, my name is Al Kasim Hamisa Abdu, a coordinator of branch libraries in the Yusuf Maitama Saleh University, Kano, Nigeria. The title of my presentation is Hosting and Delivering Open Educational Resources by the Nigerian Universities. Next. Next slide. Okay, background of the study. Uh, it is uh, most of uh, most uh, most people are aware that Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. The country is situated at West African sub region, and Nigerian case can represent can, can represent cases of Sub-Saharan Africa. So, if you know Nigerian case, more especially with regard to OER. Is like you know the cases of OER across the Af uh, sub Saharan Africa. So, Niger Nigerian educational system is constrained with the lack of resources. So, the need of educational resources. So, next, next slide. Uh, Nigerian public universities are characterized with frequent closure as a result of industrial action. And the reading of this industrial action by academic staff of Nigerian universities, one of the reason is one of the readings is lack of resources. For example, throughout 2022, all the public universities in Nigeria were closed as a result of industrial action. Currently or presently, presently today, public universities in Nigeria are, have been closed as a result of that industrial action, which is partly because of lack of resources in the university. So can you see now, there is an acute need for OER in the educational system of Nigeria and uh, I can see other African countries. So next, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, introduction. Uh, from uh, the year 2017, there were engagements 
mostly by the uh, uh, Commonwealth of Lani with the uh, uh, with the regulatory agency of the Nigerian University, that is NUC, National Universities Commission. This engagement between these two agencies culminated in a draft policy for open educational resources in the higher education of Nigeria. And the uh, adoption, of, adoption of OER as a result of that draft, of, uh, draft policy, OER are now introduced into the system. So the most um, uh, in, in, on the website of most uh, Nigerian universities, you will have a button or tab that will uh, that will indicate to their OER resources. So, but uh, the problem is that still there are not enough empirical studies on the OER situation in Nigeria. This is the gap that uh, which this presentation or this research want to fill. Because when you look at uh, uh, publications from Nigeria, you will see that the, the uh, issue of OER is not well reported. This, uh, so this uh, work want to be an exploratory work to report the situation of OER in Nigeria. Next. Next slide. Uh, the, method the methodology adopted in this work is, uh, a con uh, is a content analysis, whereby the websites of all the public universities in Nigeria were visited and analyzed for us to have evidences of their engagement or the, what they are doing about open educational resources. How are they engaged with open educational resources? More especially because that draft policy uh, required the Nigerian universities to, uh, to engage or to adopt open educational resources to try to develop policies on implementing or uh, of adopting open educational resources. So this work visited their websites to see what, how, where they are, what they are doing in order to see that they integrate open educational resources into their pedagogy. Uh, 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 the researcher visited the websites with, uh, uh, within the period of August, between the period of August and September of this year. Although still there are universities without websites. So, and there are universities with websites, but the websites are not active. You will visit the website so many times, but the website will not go, will not launch you to any resources. So we uh, segregated this one and work with only those that their websites was active within that period of, uh, of, 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 of the research. So next slide, next slide. So as a result, the researcher was able to visit and analyze the, web, the website of 36 federal universities and 70 and the 67 private universities, as well as 41 state universities. And the tools that were used in analyzing the websites were one, browsing the websites to see what they have, what they are doing, how they are engaged with OER. Secondly, internal search engines of the websites was used to search OER or open, or, or open educational resources so that to see if they have something about that. And lastly, site map of the institute of the websites was also used to see 
what they have and on what they are doing and how they are engaged with open educational resources. Next. Next slide. So this is a summary of what the results uh, discovered. Uh, in this graph, you will see bars for bars for each category category of universities in Nigeria. The one in blue will tell you the total number of universities within that category. The second one indicates the indicates uh, the number of the number of web pages that were accessible within that category of universities. The yellow, the third, which is uh, yellow, indicates the number of our sample. Then the purple one, number of universities where we see that they have a link or yes they have a link or button on their website to which indicate that uh, a link to the website where they deposit their oer resources so the last one which is red uh, is a number of uh, number without number of website uh, universities website without without uh, without link to OER. So this is what it shows. The first group is uh, federal universities. They, they are few in number, but uh, they are the first sectors. They are the first, mostly, they are mostly the first generation universities in Nigeria and they are directly controlled by the federal government and since the regulatory agency NUC is the federal government agency any decision of the NUC will reach the federal institution more it will reach the uh, uh, the federal universities instantly so it's like federal universities are more closer to federal government than other universities. By the middle, the middle cluster represents private universities. There you can see that they are more in number, but uh, uh, adopting or engaging with offering educational resource, uh, resources is, proportion, is proportionately low, low, lower there. The last cluster represent state universities. State universities, they are not, they are, they are public universities, but they are not directly under, they are not directly and totally under the federal, the control, more especially in terms of funding. They are not directly in control of the federal government. But uh, despite that there, you will see that the, their engagement with the open educational resources is higher than in the federal universities. So this is uh, is like a summary of what uh, the researcher have seen from visiting and analyzing the website of the Nigerian University. Let us go to the next slide. Okay, results continue. The work also discovered that uh, the most common resources you will find out with the universities who have engagement with offering educational resources are these categories. Books, conference proceedings, courseware, inaugural lecture, uh, journal articles, lecture notes, project, uh, lecture notes, Okay, next slide. And from this slide, you can see the categories that, um, that uh, the, 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 the most frequently populated categories of open educational resources and the least populated categories of open educational resources. Next slide. Next. 
this the these are the observations from the uh, finding of the study it is the often educational resources is more aligned with the public universities in nigeria and there is little scholarship on the area of offering educational resources we couldn't see any conference from the universities around the area of offering educational resources and we couldn't identify any journal title with the scope of with the with the open educational resources as its scope and also on many instances or many instances the content of oer sites are shallow and stagnated you will find out you will see few resources and mostly resources without frequent update without recent update and in most cases, there are no there are no policies uh, on the website of the uh, uh, OER policies on the website of Nigerian universities. And also, we observe that the practice is very crude and rudimentary. Uh, and we also observe that there is very little linkages with more popular OER programs like the MIT courseware. The open stacks, the press book, you hardly see a university create a link to these resources, at least to encourage reuse repurposing on the uh, in the university. Next slide. These are a few recommendations which we think will uh, assist in developing open educational resources in Nigeria so that at least Nigeria will appear somewhere on the map of open educational on the global map of open educational resources one educational policy makers should try to see that that draft policy is implemented and secondly proponents and uh, supporters of oer for example the commonwealth for planning unesco should make thank you very much okay UNESCO should try to, and there is need for more scholarship and awareness campaign around the area of open educational resources, mostly from bottom of next slide, which uh, is the last, I think. Hello. Hello, next. Okay, thank you for your time to be with me to uh, to at least know a little about the situation of open educational resources in Nigeria. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm stopping sharing my screen right now. A uh, little, little issue. Am I? There we go. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, this will be time for about five minutes of uh, Q and A. Um, if folks want to raise their hand, they definitely can, or they can go ahead and just uh, go ahead and meet, unmute themselves and speak. So I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, so you said there was very little to no scholarship on this uh, subject in Nigeria. Do you see yourself and your colleagues publishing any scholarship on this at some point? I'm sure uh, I started it at least last year or last two years. And uh, I'm sure there are a few people who are now becoming aware of the potential of open educational resources in the Nigerian educational system. So I'm aware the scholarship, I, am, uh, I, I hope the scholarship uh, is uh, about to uh, grow now around the area. But uh, uh, presently, uh, uh, presently, I can see the scholarship around the area is not something to uh, actually to, to to say that it is uh, enough or at least it is something that you can tell does anyone else have a question they would like to ask there are people are also welcome to drop their questions in the chat as well Hello. 
Yes, I'm just waiting to see if anybody else has any other questions. All right, on that note then, we'll have our next presentation at 2.50. I'll go ahead and stop recording. So if folks want to chat with one another in the, in the chat box, they're definitely welcome to. Or you can get up, take a very short walk, do whatever you like to do. And then we'll be back here in this space at 2.50. Thank you so much to our first two presenters. Jen, uh, uh, I'm running under the assumption that the majority of folks here are not mathematicians. Um, and I built my uh, talk accordingly. Um, so there will be, I, I think a total of two math equations in here. I will try to make them as unscary as possible <laughs> to my non-math people. Um, uh, but um, I, 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 my, my goal is to make this approachable to anybody here um, and give some ideas of some resources out there. So um, the first thing, uh, I just wanna give a, a, a quick overview, uh, what to expect, what this talk is about. Um, really, I, I, I see this as a vehicle of, 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 of talking about and introducing um, an OER product called My Open Math. Um, and, and the story I'm going to tell starts with kind of my journey and how I discovered My Open Math um, and, 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 and how I came to it and, and the process there. And it'll be through this journey um, uh, through the non standard uh, calculus. Um, so um, if you've taken a calculus course, hopefully. Um, somebody told you who the founders of, of the course were, um, Sir Isaac Newton and uh, um, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, both mathematicians in the um, uh, mid to late 1600s. Um, and um, uh, they, they both kind of came across it from different perspectives, trying to answer different questions. Um, but, but they both used a, a notion uh, of what I would call infinitesimals. And an infinitesimal, just an intuitive idea, an infinitesimal is just a number is so small, so incrementally small that it almost has no um, effect on, on calculations. So, so small, it's, it's immeasurable. And this is a really important idea, especially to um, Isaac Newton, who is trying to get a handle on, on velocity, in particular instantaneous velocity. And he wanted to ask, what's the what, how fast is something going at an instant? Well, in an instant, absolutely no time has gone by, which um, if you think about what a velocity, miles per hour, that kind of idea, that means you're dividing by zero. And that's just something in mathematics. That's a, that's a giant no-no. Um, it, it, you will break mathematics if you try to, divide by zero, um, there's nothing consistent. But they had a little kind of sneaky workaround by using these so small, they're practically zero, but they're not quite. And, and both uh, Newton and, and Leibniz uh, 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 give their inspiration to the idea of, of infinitesimals um, to a predecessor of theirs, um, uh, Fermat, um, who in his own right was a very famous mathematician. Um, uh, in, in the early mid 1600s, very prolific. If you've heard of Fermat's last theorem, a very famous theorem, it was his proposition. Um, and, and, and he uh, did some work with infinitesimals and really kind of was a, did some precursory work to calculus. Um, but he himself would give credit um, to Diophantus, um, which goes all the way back to um, the 200s AD. So this idea of the infinitesimal um, is, is, is a very old and ancient idea, but there's a reason why it's, it, it doesn't have strong flavors or favor, sorry, to mathematicians today. And in large part is because these infinitesimals are so small, they're kind of wily little beasts and it's hard to be very rigorous with them. And as I said, I mean, they, by the time Newton and Leibniz were playing around with these, it had been over 1500 years, uh, nearly 1500 years, and, and still mathematicians didn't have a good grasp of, of how to prove things with infinitesimals. Just knew they could work with them, but didn't have a lot of confidence that everything was working well. And to a mathematician, that's a nervous place to be because we build up theorem upon theorem upon theorem. And if at the, and if at the bottom, the underpinning is shaky or could break, then that means everything that's built upon it could fall apart as well. Um, so it, it really isn't until the uh, mid 1800s that finally mathematicians kind of get a way to solidify the calculus without infinitesimals. So everyone's been doing calculus 
Um, great discoveries had been made in physics due to the calculus. And so there was a lot riding on the idea that calculus had to have a strong underpinning. And there was a deep concern about the infinitesimals. And so um, we give uh, 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 credit to, to Weierstrass in the 1800s of solidifying exactly um, how we could do calculus without infinitesimals. And this was his definition. And so this is one of two equations. If this is alphabet soup to you, well, it is to my calculus students as well. Um, on day one, we, we talk about a limit because we've got to have limits to talk about derivatives and everything that's part of the calculus. And I put up this very technical, um, full of math jargon equation and their eyes glow, glow, glaze over and they fall asleep. Uh, and now, don't get me wrong. I actually adore and love this equation. As a mathematician, I've worked well with it. It is a fantastic equation. It opens all sorts of, 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 of problems and uh, I wouldn't wanna be without it. So I love it, but from a, from a teaching perspective, it really um, removes any intuition from my students. And, and, and that's the last thing I wanna do. In a math class, I want them to have intuition. And all this is saying is that when x is close to a, f of x is close to l. And if I say it to my students, they kind of get that idea. If, some, if, if the input is close to a, the output is close to l. But when they see that bottom line for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, blah, 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 blah. And that's what they hear, absolutely nothing. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, it is finally in the 1960s um, uh, that Abraham Robinson demonstrates, proves from a mathematically rigorous perspective that infinitesimals are actually okay. There's no, we don't have to be worried that we're building our, 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 our house on, on shaky ground. And in fact, he says, well, this whole limit idea, we could, we could disregard what Weierstrass says and just say, if X is infinitely close to A or X is really close to A, F of X is close to L. And this, you know, this is not quite equality, but it's that it's close to, and that captures exactly the intuition that, that, that I would want my students, I do want my students to have. Well, why isn't every textbook now, if this is how students think about it, why isn't every textbook, there's lots of reasons to that, um, but there are at least some textbooks out there. Uh, the very first one that was created that uses this non-standard notion of, of calculus, uh, was by uh, um, a Jerome Kiesler uh, in 1971, I think is the copyright of the first edition. Um, and, um, uh, and there's a couple of other textbooks that do the same. Okay, how does this tie into an OER? How, how does infinitesimal tie into OER? Well, the reason for it is that in 2000, Kiesler um, licensed his second edition as a Creative Commons uh, um, licensing. And so now here's a textbook that is an OER textbook. It's in the public domain. And I come across this textbook uh, early 2018. Um, and I'm excited about it because like I said, it fits in with what I, my intuition about the calculus and what I think students are. And so I wanna use this in my course. Unfortunately, textbooks from 1971 don't translate too well to my students in 2018. Um, um, there's no interactivity. There is no homework delivery system. Um, because it's non-standard, I can't even point them to some of the resources that are out there, Khan Academy, uh, uh, Math is Power for You, any of these large resources. Um, no publisher out there has homework systems for non-standard calculus. So I've got a concept, an idea that I wanna teach to my students, but I don't have the underpinnings, the, the machinery to deliver it to them. And so I take on um, the, the, the heavy lifting and say, well, I'm gonna create it myself. Um, first things first, I decide um, that um, I'm gonna focus on creating videos and extra resources that students can use um, when they're at home to learn about the infinitesimal calculus, how it all ties together. Um, again, because I can't send them to Khan Academy. I can't send them, uh, I can't even send them to my tutors. Uh, I had to train my tutors here at my campuses, campus to what non-standard calculus is. So, so I wanted to have this resource for him, but I still wanted to have homework. So I, I um, uh, used at the time, 2018, 1920, um, used um, a, a resource called Newton. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. 
Um, it's gone through several name changes. It started out as Newton, became Newton Alta, um, then got bought by Wiley. It's now Wiley Newton. Um, and this was a, a good fix for my predicament. I could, I could have um, homework delivered to the students and Newton allowed me to get in and kind of work under the hood and create particular questions that were just unique to the infinitesimal calculus. It was an okay fix, but not an ideal fix. Until um, last year, year and a half ago, maybe, um, I was working um, uh, with a, another group in, in Open Educational Resources here on my campus, and, and somebody introduced me to my open math. And this uh, was the answer to all my questions, homework delivery system wise. And I, I want to stress, um, even though I come at my open math uh, using this homework delivery system from an infinitesimal to answer my needs for an infinitesimal calculus, that is not the purpose of this homework system. It is built large part in, in large writ for all the math community. In fact, it has over a million uh, questions in its database and then categorize, we've got topics from arithmetic, algebra, calculus down to um, applied, uh, some chemistry type problems. Um, and even in, in the calculus, we could narrow it, you know, drill it down and problems directly related to differentials and integrals, differential equations. So existing in this community is a um, huge database of already existing problems. And, Hold on, let me step back. I, I, did, I need to give credit where it's due. Uh, David Lippman is the uh, uh, individual who spearheaded the development of my open math. Um, it started in 2005 in Washington as a small project. I think 2011, it was opened up to the larger community. Um, I, I believe I have my dates right there. Um, but I just wanna give credit where credit's due because that group over there has done some fantastic heavy lifting. But now there's, there's a large community of mathematicians that contribute to it, they create problems, um, create, you know, create resources um, that, because it's OER, it's open to anybody and everyone. Um, and let me just quickly kind of go through the types of questions um, that students could see that you could deliver to your students in this in my open math. So um, as you'd expect, there's, there's multiple choice, there's multiple answers, there's matching. So these are kind of very simple, straightforward, but there's even, you can enter in uh, numeric answers and you can, you can adjust uh, the, um, uh, uh, how, you know, uh, um, your errors allowed in here. So uh, how many, you know, how precise you want your answers. Um, you could enter in things as matrices. Um, you could have interval notation. So it's got enough uh, power to, 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 to automatically grade such questions. Um, and in fact, um, it can even it even has a, a, a somewhat algebraic uh, um, machinery underpinning it, and then I could have students simplify an expression and enter in the algebraic expression here, and it would be able to grade whether it's correct or not. And the students themselves um, have a, a, a really great interface uh, for entering it, entering in their answers. Um, so you can have exponents, subscripts, square roots. Um, all kind of the standard interface you would you would want a student to be able to write out a mathematical expression. Um, as I said, it can grade these things automatically, and even um, so, my mathematicians. If you look at this, you would know that um, I could model this the sum of these two graphs, um, but it would not have a unique answer, um, and it has the ability of recognizing yes, this is equivalent to whatever the expected answer would be, but you can also put constraints on it. Um, and say, oh, I only want to have, say, positive exponents. So it's very robust um, in, in its um, scoring system. Um, it also has um, uh, some pretty sophisticated graphing abilities. So you could pose a question to your students that you graph a point, or you could have them even uh, you know, graph a piecewise function. It doesn't have to be linear. It could be quadratic, cubics, hyperbolas, ellipses. There's lots of different um, types of graphing type problems that students could work on. and so. Um, it, it, it almost anything you would find in one of the the, the for profit, uh, you know, my my op or sorry, uh, um, uh, Connect Math or or Alex or or you know, Pearson's project, any of these, the types of questions you could see there, you are they exist already here in my open math. So it's a very uh, uh, robust um, uh, program. I'm kind of skipped past some of the others. So so there's lots of types of questions in here you could pose. 
it, just like Connect Math and these other systems, if you're familiar, um, you can build an entire course in the in in my open math. And so the students would interact and they would see modules, they could see a calendar, they'd have homework problems, video type lessons, um, or um, you can export it and run it natively in your LMS. So I here at my campus, we, we use um, um, Canvas. And so um, um, I could export it and directly into Canvas. Um, they have native exports into Blackboard, D2L, and Moodle. Um, and so if you use any of those uh, LMS, you could directly import the entire uh, um, shell of a program into those LMS. The types of interface that students would see, um, um, I, I've got various interfaces. I, um, for many of my classes, I have pre-reading assignments. And so I create these assignments where I embed videos um, and then they have to answer questions related to um, those videos. Um, I can also, I also have very standard homework assignments. So they'll have, you know, uh, 14, 15, 16, so uh, problems and um, they would work on them and interface again, exactly like they would in a publisher's homework system. Um, and, and I can, just like in those four, pro, you know, four pay systems, I can adjust um, how many times students could work on the same problem. Do they get, um, you know, how many uh, related questions they can do. So there's lots of uh, fine tuning there. And you can even do uh, exams or quizzes. So I can put a timer on it. Um, so, um, and I, and I want to point out that my open math, you can, um, there are directly right off the shelf solutions. You can, you can pull modules, pull full courses directly off the shelf and use them immediately. You can um, create your own shells. Um, so kind of quickly here um, that if I wanted to create a course, sorry. Justin, um, just so you know, we are at time. Okay, uh, then I'm gonna just scoot right past this. Um, I'd say real quickly, um, so not only can you pull it off the shelf, but as for me, how this answer my salute, my problem, I wanted to create problems that related to um, uh, non-standard calculus. I can get down, right down to the nitty gritty and, and actually edit the code of, the, of a problem. So I can create it from scratch or I can edit other people's code. Um, and so it, it, it has a wide breadth of, of uses to the community. And um, here are just some kind of pros and cons. It's OER, it stands alone, it integrates. Those are all really strong uh, features, I think. Uh, some of the cons that I could think of, because it's OER, there's no technical support. So um, if you need help with it, um, you, you can reach out to the community. It's a very robust community, but there's no uh, call center. There's no rep that you could call in and get help. Um, and the same for students. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, uh, again, I'm Justin Potter. I'm at the Collin College in uh, uh, just north of Dallas, Texas. Any questions? Thank you so much for that, that presentation. Um, this, as you say, this is time for questions. Our next uh, presentation is scheduled for 315. So if people do have questions and we want to go a little bit past 310, that should be fine. I did see one question already come up in chat. How do your colleagues compare my other math to the publisher products? What is their biggest pro as well as their biggest con? I know you kind of started talking about that at the end. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> you let me come back to the same slide. I would say the biggest con uh, comes down to the, 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 the technical support. Um, and and um, there's a bit of a, especially if you want to create your own problems from scratch using, you know, getting down and using the, the, the code. Um, um, the, the documentation is available. David Littman has, I, I think, done a fantastic job of building some documentation, but it can be a little confusing. So on the, on the, on the, on, on the developer side, um, there's some, some documentation things that can be confusing. For the student, so if a student runs into a problem in my open math, um, they don't have a, I mean, they're just gonna come to you and you're gonna have to try to figure out where that is, you know, if there's any technical problems. So that would be my biggest, con, um, though, in my opinion, the pros outweigh it. I, I think it, 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 it acts as well as any of the existing publisher homework systems. Um, so I think it's comparable quite well. 
Um, do I have any general recommendations for getting math faculty buy-in? Um, on we're we're a little bit slow here in at, at Wiley or in, at Colin, sorry, um, in in jumping into the OER space. Um, and it's in part just happened uh, a, a few faculty uh, uh, we we started getting interested in it. Uh, started a small group and it's grown by just sharing what we're doing and um, giving presentations in-house, in um, talking and sharing with people. So for buy-in, I think the best way is to, to just build a cohort on your campus and start sharing and talking with others. The more you can show that, that it works, the proof of, proof of principle, uh, the, the easier it is to get over other faculty's um, you know, concerns and, and, and fears. Great question. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, do we have any other questions for Dustin? Perfect. Well, our next presentation, I'm going to go ahead and pause recording. We really have, um, we don't really have weather outside of living on the surface of the sun. So great for people like me. Um, and I found my myself in need of a new career and ended up switching um, to education and, and found my spot as a resident faculty member at a small community college and really thrived in that shift um, from going from someone with a master's degree in cellular biology, which I obtained while working in that lab that I was at. Um, I found that while my master's gave me a really great grounding to talk about my content, I didn't really understand um, pedagogy, pedagogy good Lord, I can't speak today, pedagogy and andragogy in a way that was beneficial to my students. So I thought, you know, I should really dig into um, some, some of these MOOC things I had never heard of before and see what I could learn. And I started using OER courses and OER materials in order to make myself a better faculty member. Um, I loved it so much that I actually ended up getting a doctorate in education. And in this process of being a lead faculty member, I actually became um, or excuse me, a resident faculty member, I became a lead, which is our terminology for department chair. Uh, and in the last year and a half, I have since trans transitioned to associate dean. So while I was a biologist, um, now I'm working with folks who teach everything from astronomy and geology and geography and oceanography um, to engineering, mathematics, and the life and physical sciences. So I get to do a little bit of everything, which is wonderful. And at that same moment in all of these things and everything that I've done, I myself personally have benefited from OER materials. So it's always kind of been a, a point of passion for me. Um, I will say though, as we discuss this and, and talk about these topics today, I'm going to start off a little strangely. I'm going to start off with an apology. I gave a presentation at a conference in Boston not too long ago, and I really touched on some hot button issues for a faculty member who didn't feel that it was appropriate um, for an administrator to be talking about OER and an administrator to be encouraging people to use OER. I was kind of out of my lane and she had some very, I, I clearly hurt her feelings. So if you are of the mindset that administrators don't belong in these conversations, I'm going to apologize now. Um, I am still an adjunct faculty member. I am a firm believer that I can't um, speak to the student experience if I'm not in the student experience. So I've made it a point to continue teaching. So I apologize if I hurt your feelings speaking as an administrator. Um, I recognize that my team is amazing and that they make me look good. So I do everything that I can do to support them. Um, so just starting off with an apology. So what we are going to do for this presentation is that we are going to pretend for the next 20 minutes, that's a lie for the next 11 minutes and 30 seconds, um, that y'all are faculty members. Each of you is a faculty member because I have noticed in these various conversations that a lot of people see value in OER, but they really struggle um, getting faculty members on board. And I have noticed in these large sessions that I'm now um, expected to manage and to lead that a lot of the times when we're doing um, these large presentations on OER or basically anything at your school, you've all seen it, everyone walks in and they're just dead eyed. So I have made it a point to have my conversations about OER or really anything policy related. I do my best to have them in small group conversations one on one when I can with my faculty. So, and I don't obviously use a PowerPoint or this is a Canva presentation, but I don't use those things when I'm presenting. But this is my thought process. This is how I walk my way through these conversations with some of my faculty who are a little bit hesitant about these ideas of OER. 
Um, I always start and I ask them to embrace this, just embrace, embrace these three short sentences. When it comes down to it, and hear me out, OER is easier. OER is more enjoyable for you and your students. And OER is, if we're getting picky, more appropriate. So let's break down those three easy concepts, three simple things to embrace. Um, OER is easier because you have total control. So when you're walking into your classroom, and we all kind of know here at Mojave Community College, where I work, we vote on our materials as a team. So all of my instructors who are teaching general chemistry, they use the same materials. And obviously, when you have a large department, um, that can turn into quite the interesting discussion. Our English folks really struggle with this because there's such different ways to approach that. So I always tell them it's easier for you to plan your courses if you're going OER, because if we're OER, everyone can pick what they want. Um, if it's free materials, then if you don't particularly like what your colleague across the hall is using, then that's completely fine. We all kind of know when we get assigned these giant textbooks and you're just like, you could teach a degree from this book, let alone a biology class, like goodness gracious, who's including this much content. So you have to start choosing individual chapters or your blending sections, or it's, you know, this chunk of pages and this chunk of pages and this chunk of pages. And then you have to update that every time they update the textbook, which is every seven seconds. It just makes it a mess. But when you're using OER, you don't have to do that. You have direct control and you can teach from your comfort zone. You can teach your, your passions, teach your preferences. Um, the nice thing about OER as well is that you know this material. If you teach OER, you can teach from your passion point. I'm a cellular biologist, um, but from just a personal perspective, I really love baking. The more complicated, the better. So when it comes to a lot of my biological concepts that I'm teaching my students, I actually tie a lot of them back to baking. If you're not a biologist, you may think I'm a little crazy, but I promise it works. Um, so if something's not working, if a piece of technology is not working, if I can't pull something up, I can't pull down a resource, that's completely fine because I can talk to you for days about the process of making a perfect um, loaf of bread, which is an excellent way to talk to my students about fermentation and all sorts of other things with chemistry and enzymes and temperatures and pH and all the things that I can do. So teaching from an OER perspective and not being married to a textbook I don't particularly like makes my job easier. It also makes my job easier in that I encourage all of my faculty to share absolutely everything that they make. Because it's OER and because we're all kind of using um, the same, we do all use the same platform. We're a Canvas institution. We're regularly sharing modules. We have open groups for our faculty. So because everything is being shared, um, again, OER just makes it easier if we choose to embrace it. Um, the next concept is that OER is more enjoyable. We've touched on this a little bit before. So not only is it easier because I can talk about an excellent loaf of sourdough bread using my 200 year old starter, my instructors who, um, you know, are, are getting stuck in the muck, if they teach from their passions, then they can kind of get over that hurdle. So for example, I have um, a chemist, he teaches my general chemistry and my major is chemistry for me. Um, but his background is actually um, marine science. He's a marine biologist, but his focus was chemistry. So I had a conversation with him. I said, you know, Paul, if you really look at your list of competencies in this chemistry class, you can teach absolutely everything from a marine biology perspective, relate everything to the ocean. All of these concepts can be rooted in oceanography, but you can't do that with your current book. And it was, you know, you just got the, the bright eyes and the big smile. Well, I didn't think about it that way. Well, I didn't think about it that way either until about six months ago. <laughs> but now he's embracing this idea because he can take all these dry chemistry concepts and insert his passion. And he is not, um, he always kind of jokes, well, of course, your students like you, you're bubbly and you're bouncy and you're tiny. Um, and he's like, I'm a grumpy old man. Well, it's, he does not look like a grumpy old man when he's getting to embrace his passion and show that to his students. Um, so not only is he doing that, but he's pulling in his research that he did as a student, which obviously makes him light up and makes him more energetic. Um, and you just get to show that joy, show your joy um, in your field as a whole. I don't always talk about baking. I often talk about my dog. I'm a kayaker. We have some very interesting things that happen in the water around here where I am. I'm very close to Lake Mead and Lake Mojave. So as you're doing OER, 
You can pull in basically anything that makes you happy and use that to teach rather than being stuck in this stilted framework. We just had this conversation as a department where someone was saying, you know, I I feel guilty that I don't use more of the book because we're making the students pay for it. So she's putting herself in this box that's just not well suited to who she is. And in my opinion, the more um, joy my faculty find in their work, the better instructors they're going to be. So anything that I can help them to do to embrace that joy, um, in my opinion, is a win. It's a win for them and it's a win for our students because if we're happy, our students are going to be more engaged. Um, the third concept is, frankly, it's more appropriate. So this goes across a lot of different areas. So for example, um, I always like to tell my students, we won't get into the physics of it, but the Smithsonian spent a whole lot of money making this really beautiful astrophysics display. And literally the, the day before this big exhibit was supposed to open, um, NASA made this announcement that they had discovered something. This concept was no longer valid. And the poor Smithsonian, their whole new wing was basically outdated. They had to open up this new wing of the Smithsonian with a big sign that says, hey, we literally discovered yesterday that this is kind of all wrong. We're sorry. Um, if you're teaching OER, you don't have to worry about that as much because then as um, as we discover things, as new work is published, just pull it in. Some faculty struggle a little bit with that because we're used to having these super prescriptive syllabi at the beginning of the semester, you know, I'm, they feel like they have to be able to say four months from now on Tuesday at nine o'clock, we're going to be talking about page 213 in your textbook. So I've been encouraging my faculty to be a little bit more flexible. I, I want you to nail down um, your content so we can make sure that we're mapping and that we know that we're teaching all of our competencies. I want you to have very clear instructions for your students about what's expected of them, when can they plan for testing, when can they plan for assignments, but just have topics that they're going to discuss. You don't have to have a page number. So when something really cool does come up, if you can fit it into that topic, that's okay. That's completely fine. And that's going to, again, make your course more enjoyable and more engaging because if you get to say, you know, hey, as I was preparing for class two weeks ago, I saw X and you can bring that in. And that's very relevant, not only in science, but in business. How often are things changing in economics? I mean, look at what we're doing. If you're using an, an economics textbook that's even just two years old, it's probably largely out of date. Business figures are constantly being updated. Um, I mean, if you're a, a classics teacher, classics haven't changed in a while, um, but there are lots of different fields where things are constantly changing and we have these new materials. So you can make your teaching more appropriate, more up to date um, by embracing OER materials and recognizing that it does give you um, kind of a whole new world to pull from because everything that you can be pulling from is more modern, which is likely to increase engagement with your students. The other nice thing is, um, is that we know now there's a lot of research I won't harp on you we know now that open pedagogy really makes a big difference um that's kind of the next step in open educational resources is just open pedagogy in general build these assignments that add on to one another and bring in your students and give them that ownership um make them I always say advanced um enhanced stakeholders because if they take pride in a product that they know future students will see, you're kind of opening up a whole new world of educational experiences for those students. And you're empowering them to recognize that they own their education, which gives them an increased sense of responsibility, which in my experience makes them a little more likely to, to, to give that extra effort that we need them to give in class. So if you're thinking like, lady, this sounds awesome, but how in God's name do you convince people to do these things? Or how do you get them to kind of let go of some of those more restrictive ideas? I teach them about backwards course design without saying I'm teaching them about backwards course design. Um, what we do is I take, I just had a really wonderful experience. Um, I'm lucky enough to have some new faculty on my team who are teaching general biology. So we went into one of our course rooms that has um, lots of whiteboards and we wrote out our major concepts and we decided, you know, these are the, the big competencies that we want to tackle today that are part of this class in our documented course package. This is what we have promised to teach our students. And then we did, you know, what is the, um, what evidence does a student need to create for us to prove that they know that thing? And you turn that evidence into an assessment. And then now that you say, all right, at the end of the day, I would like my students to be able to do X, Y, and Z 
then we can start lesson planning and then we can start plugging in our materials. And if you work it in this direction, rather than taking a textbook and then creating a class, they take a course and they find materials that make them excited and engaged. Um, and that's how you can bring them to these lovely OER materials and make them realize that they already have these skills. They already have the knowledge. They likely just need to be encouraged to get there. <laughs> so that's kind of the basics. Again, a very quick 15 minutes. If you have any questions or would like some clarifications, um, please reach out. This is my email. I'm Tanya Jackson at mojave.edu. Um, well, I'm not to ask mojave.edu, but that's my email. So <laughs> And this time I'll stop sharing so we can actually see each other. I always feel so awkward on Zoom. Um, here we go. More change is hard. You are not wrong. You are absolutely not wrong. More change is hard, um, which is why I always try to go at it from that positive perspective of, yes, this is more change, but ultimately this will make your life easier because I remind my students, or my students, goodness gracious, my faculty, especially those that are particularly married to their textbooks, you're going to have to do this anyway when they come out with a new edition. Um, for us, our bookstore doesn't allow us we're, um, to sell old editions. We have to encourage our students to purchase the new ones, which means that they have to be buying these new, these new textbooks anyway. Um, so some of them, I encourage them. I say, okay, well, if you want to think about this and then the next time textbook orders come around and we know, hey, you're going to have to switch to a new $300 calculus textbook. And in the state of Arizona, in our county, that's the average food budget for your student's family for the month. Have that conversation with yourself. Do you really think your students are going to forego their food budget for calculus textbook? And then let's move forward at that step. Um, someone did put, you know, all of this is really important for inclusive education. That is a wonderful high point that you can teach to your students. Um, I, it sounds, I mean, I am a white lady from Chicago, but I recognize that my students are not white women from Chicago. Their textbooks don't include anyone who looks like them. And I can't imagine how that must make someone feel to never grow up seeing anyone in their textbooks or anyone in positions of power over them or anyone not having someone to look up with them. I mean, if you've opened your eyes here recently, there's news stories everywhere about all these little girls bawling because they get to see Ariel and Ariel looks like them. Imagine from an education perspective, never having a single example of a person who looks like you. When you're choosing your OER materials and you're building these things, you can pull in some of these other scientists or pull in some of these other experts who are doing incredible work, but they're not being recognized by traditional publishers. Um, so that's a wonderful part that where you can pull in these students. And if, if anything, at the end of the day, for some of my more stubborn faculty, I tell them research shows us that about 65% of students do not choose to buy their textbooks simply because they can't afford them. And you are going, eventually, you're going to get judged by your pass rates. We don't do it every single semester, but if your students are constantly failing and if they're failing, not because you're a bad instructor, but because they can't afford your textbook, that means something. Your students are more likely to be successful if they have access to your education materials. I don't like to go negative, um, but sometimes you just have to lay it out for people. Your students aren't passing because they can't read the book because they can't get the pause on it because it costs more than the food. So if you would like them to be successful, then we need to provide them with materials and be respectful of that. So that's my soapbox. If I've been like reading the chat as it comes up, if anyone else has anything, I'd be happy to address it. <laughs> So listening to your conversation um, right now, uh, particularly about the point of, you know, students don't want to spend $300 on in a textbook that's basically just a slightly updated version of what came out like two years ago. Um, so I'm a librarian and frequently we can't really buy the newest textbooks because they're so expensive. Mm -hmm. Also, there's going to be another one in two years. So I'm yeah. wondering if you have um, partnered with your library at all or... Yeah. Oh, yes. I am of the opinion. So when I was four, I decided that librarians were magicians and I still very much hold on to that belief. Yeah. Um, sure. Yes. No, our, <laughs> our library, our librarians are beyond incredible human beings. They build um, library guides for us. They build course guides for us. They're constantly pulling in new materials. They do try to get um, their hands on the open. We use a lot of open stacks. They do try to keep the open stacks materials out there. We do have 
So we use my open math. If you listen to the last session, that was all about calculus and my open math. My open math is amazing. One of my faculty is an administrator and I thank my stars every day for Dr. Laurel Clifford. Um, so, but we do have, we got a grant to publish some materials to go with that. And one of our high fail math classes. So our students who didn't have the ability to print that stuff, the librarians created like these packets and they actually create like class bags. It sounds a little funny, but you come and you can check out a bag and it has like a calculator and math games and flashcards and your materials. And it's like a whole little packet of things to help you be successful when studying X, Y, or Z. They have really fun ones for other things too. You can get a game night and it's games and movies and popcorn and you can check it out. Um, fun things like again, librarians or magicians. Um, but yeah, no, we work really closely with our library staff. Um, they're incredible, incredible partners and in finding and in, in helping us to organize materials and do all of these things for our students. That sounds wonderful. And that's such a cool twist on what a lot of public libraries do with the, the class bags. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I could keep talking about that, but I want to make sure, does anybody else have any questions or comments that they wanted to throw out there? All right. So our, our last session will be in five minutes. Uh, of course, if anybody does think of anything that they would like to talk about, you know, feel free to continue that chat. We got five minutes. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for your presentation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording for a moment. Hello, I'm Kim Brewer, and this is Stephanie Cole from the Department of History at UT Arlington. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. So we'll see how lucky I am at doing this. We are a um, Teams campus, so we don't we use, we're very good at Teams, not as good as um, others with Zoom. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so we're historians and obviously we have to, to find images that suit all of our purposes that are historic. And I think this image here sums up our problem. We wanted to make a, um, an OER using information from multiple faculty but is it a case of, can you do this? Can you have your entire faculty or a good chunk of them come together to make a departmental OER or not? And we had a rough journey here and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm trying to, there we go. So the course we had in mind is a historical methods course and historical methods is one of the few courses that all history majors must take. And we realized we had a problem, a curricular problem um, in that our students avoided this class into the senior year, but we knew it was better if they took it earlier. We knew they needed remediation. We had a lot of internal data and assessment that we had done on this course. And as part of a general overhaul of our curriculum, we split this course into two with a capstone project. And then this is a true introduction, not only to methods, but also to the discipline of history. And so we reimagined this course as as the first stop on the journey to a history degree. And since most of our majors transfer in from community colleges or come in um, in other ways core complete with the history courses, uh, this is often the first time that they're actually having college level history. So we wanted to make sure we gave them all of the scaffolded skills they actually needed to succeed in our program. But we also knew we had to introduce them to the historical profession. We wanted to provide them with career opportunities. So we completely reimagined what this course was. At the same time, and this was back in um, um, 1819 and the before times, at the same time, uh, the university decided that we're going to have a transfer student course. And so all students transferring into UT Arlington would have to take a one hour course about um, skills, about career opportunities in their chosen fields, um, and also other information about the university and services of the university. So we decided that we were given the opportunity to do this. We decided that we would take over this and embed it into our methods course, since there was a lot of crossover already. And so some departments have decided to do this. Others take, have a standalone course that is offered. So we had to do two things now. We're not only teaching our, our baby methods is what we started calling it. We're teaching um, career um, profession, but also student success. That led us to our discussion of now what do we do? 
there are a lot of textbooks you can choose from um, that we chose for our previous upper division historical methods course. And we were never really satisfied. So often we would assign two or sometimes even more, or, or we'd take chapters from one and have them purchase another. So it was always a mess to begin with, but now there's even more of a problem. There is no adequate textbook that we could use. Um, the traditional texts that we chose from before or cobbled together, they're more geared toward writing that big, long um, research paper, which we're no longer doing in this course. And we also didn't have up-to-date methods because research methods evolve very quickly in our digital age. And they accelerated during the pandemic as well. So that was our first problem. We actually didn't have a textbook to use, but we also knew because we had a committee because we always have committees for everything, right? We had a committee that worked together to come up with the new reimagined course. And we all approach teaching skills differently. And so this is a problem. We have to have a synthesis on what we wanna teach. And we also rotate different faculty through Lot, um, um, quite a few faculty will teach this course, some of them not very often. And we also had a commitment in place for lower division courses um, for a zero dollar materials resource. So using existing OERs or other ways. And we decided we wanted to do that for this course as well, to carry on that tradition of zero dollar resources for, for a course. And so that of course led us to simply and I chose this image of, of the Paris Salon with Moliere because this is how we envision the road to OER production. Of course, we'll just write our own. We have, we will resolve the zero dollar dilemma. We will standardize some of the materials that we have to use across all the sections. It'll make it easier, one-stop shopping. We have this wonderful faculty that has all of these different skill sets. We'll just get different faculty to put together different things. It's just gonna be easy. We can revise it at will. And we had wonderful support from our UTA libraries. So this is gonna be the easiest thing in the world. Let's do it. So we started down the process in spring of 2019. We applied for and got a grant. We started writing over the summer and we very quickly hit our train wreck. Our plan was that we were going, we're, we're carrying on this, this, this image of, we're gonna have beautifully written faculty materials covering everything perfectly. We're going to embed materials from the OERs that were used for the student success. We were even gonna go out there and look at existing style guide OERs and pick and choose what was perfect for us in history. It was gonna be this, this masterpiece of all times because obviously it was gonna be so simple. And as everybody started turning in their pieces and looking at it, there was no coherence in how it was laid out. It's too wordy, it's too in depth. In some areas, it's too light in other areas. It's not suitable for undergraduates who are writing it as if they're for graduate students. It doesn't work and it didn't reflect the way that we are actually teaching the course. And so what we started doing was we pulled out the best parts and posted them as PDFs in our LMS system in Canvas. And that wasn't what we had in mind. And that's when Stephanie, who, had, who is also someone who teaches this all the time, who wasn't part of the, she was part of the committee that created this new class teaches it a lot. We had tested out things, she and I, in our different sections of it, but she had not been involved other than handing us her chunk of written material in the fiasco up until this point. And we turned to Stephanie in panic. And this is a, a panic shot, Kim tells me, from January 6th, but my office looks something like this. Um, I took over this job uh, or uh, agreed to take over this job blithely in the fall of 2019. Can you hear the kind of boom, boom, boom? Um, and was going to spend, I got a course release the spring of 2020. I'd taken on another administrative job as well. But between, I was only teaching one graduate course that spring and I was going to help pull this book together. Um, 
And uh, we were looking at the fact that this could happen. And of course, you know what happened in the spring of 2020. Nothing got written in the spring of 2020. And then it was the summer of 2020. And I was teaching this course in the fall. We were teaching online. Uh, we were committed to this class. And there were students enrolled in this class. And we didn't have uh, a textbook for it. So I jumped in uh, late summer 2020. Um, and next slide. Um, what I had here was both, you've heard Kim's analysis here, that we had too many authors talking about too many things, somewhat, some of them in too much detail, others not, uh, but we didn't have everything we needed, just uh, we had the, the student uh, success part of it, but we didn't have um, all the stuff we needed to teach. Um, Kim and I always use the term historical methods boot camp, right? This was a boot camp to teach skills. And so, some of the main skills weren't in this book uh, yet. So what I did uh, that summer was I just pulled it all apart and I said, what do I need to teach the course this fall? What, what needs to be written? How should this book be organized so that I can teach my students this fall? Um, and that was my perspective. If you look at the next slide, um, my perspective is uh, shaped by the fact that not only have I taught this class for at least 15 years uh, in its old iteration and that I had been part of a team with Kim to create it in its new iteration. So I know the course well. Uh, I'd read all those books in that uh, stack of possible textbooks. I'd read all of those. Um, and so I was able to use that uh, to, to start writing. And so I, I wrote uh, in the uh, like, like Plurry uh, in August of 2020. I'll point out that I was also moving houses during this same month. Um, and so uh, I wrote and I got enough to get us through the first month of the course. Um, and, and by the time the classes started, I had about three weeks. So another key ingredient, if you look at it from my perspective, was the fact that we, we, could, we could do this just in time. We could build this uh, we were given permission to label it under construction and we could get it out week by week and, and update it as we needed the next parts of it. Um, so I began to write that fall um, and just kind of kept adding to it over the course of that fall and then continued through. Um, I wasn't actually done with it. So this just in time is, is critical here and under construction is critical. I wasn't done with it until a year later. So I wouldn't I didn't kind of throw up my hands and tap Kim in the um, in the relay race that we were running with this text until uh, October of 21. Uh, I was able to do what I was doing too uh, because I only had to write the text part of it. I only had to figure out the stuff that a professional historian knows. I didn't have to figure out the stuff that somebody who understands digital humanities, education, HP5, that sort of stuff. My department also ponied up for a um, graduate student who understood that stuff or could figure that stuff out quickly. Uh, and so Brandon Blakesley is listed as a co-author of this textbook because he was so critical to being able to make it into a digital textbook instead of just the sort of thing that I would have written. Um, and the last thing that really made it possible was for me to not only do it under construction, but trust that my colleagues would be able to add in the future what they needed uh, for the book. And that in fact, as Kim is about to explain, is what has been happening in that book in the last year. Kim? Well, and one of the things that uh, Brandon doesn't know yet that he has been added as, as an author to this. So as soon as we go live, which is getting very close as being officially published and not um, um, in the piloting mode, he's going to find out that he's actually an author on this book because he thought he was just going to be a contributor. So that's how important he was to, to get some of the technical stuff done for us. So one of the things is, is that we have to figure out how to budget this. It did cost the department money. Um, both Stephanie and I had um, course release working on some of these along with other things. We did get a very generous grant from UTA CARES and they helped us quite a bit. Um, our library did, um, but we paid our faculty contributor stipends. And we told them when we paid them stipends that we might use an edit in, in whatever form we wanted when they gave it to us. And we've had very little complaints as, as Stephanie broke it apart and we moved it from 
one chapter to the next as we used it. And so now instead of having a whole chapter that somebody contributed, part of what they contributed might be in one chapter, part of it might be in an appendix. Um, and so that stipend was for the work and their time. So that, that's an important element here. Uh, our GTA um, was obviously not being a TA, but he was working on this. And I would say that the other part is the fact that we, that UTA library gave us the access to press books and the H5P accounts that we needed that we didn't have to pay for ourselves. So that was, you know, great, but it does cost money in here to do this, especially if you want to give, uh, you want to give stipends to uh, um, your fellow um, colleagues to contribute. And so here's our lovely color cover here that's just about ready to come out. And we did, while Stephanie put just in time out there, once we got that out there and it was in its pilot form, we actually surveyed students and the instructors of the live sections, telling them that this is a work in progress. You have the opportunity to, to shape it for the next semester and downstream. And we got some excellent comments back, not only from the instructors using it, but the students had some great insights and asked for more specific information in some areas that they didn't quite understand. And so we made some edits based upon that. Uh, so we have just, we've had two new faculty come in and they both wanted to add new information. And so we have now information on public history and digital history that just came in um, under the wire before we officially publish. And so our, we've finished the copy edits, our official publishing is imminent. And um, this semester, my students in this class are working on a companion from the um, student's point of view. What do you need to know to be a history major from where's the best place to eat on campus to how do you get you know, OER tech classes with low dollar textbooks to what are all these faculty and what do they do sort of thing. So they're, gonna, they're writing as part of that sort of transfer student getting to know the campus, they're now writing a handbook companion that's the student's view of all of this. And so what are our conclusions? Well, you notice that our image has decreased in number of everybody around that stove from the initial one. I said, Stephanie is the one in the fancy coat back there in the back. I'm in the more frumpy garb in the front. But the answer is yes, light work is great, as Stephanie pointed out. She didn't have to be the expert on everything. She just had to write all the connectives and have this vision. Um, but when everybody was tossing everything in and there was no coherence, you can't have too many people working on this. And that's where we started off. And so there has to be this small team. You need somebody to come in that has a real vision of how it can come together. Uh, you need somebody that can do the technical work. Our grad student was great. And then as part of the original grant and the idea for this book and also for the course, as we were doing this, you know, I came in to edit behind and gather in, um, information from those using it. And so it ended up being a, a group of three at the end. And of course, our OER librarians were there every step of the way and we wouldn't have done it without them. And so if you have any other questions, here's our contact information. Excellent. So hopefully we came in right on time. Yeah, just about. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And of course, I always appreciate any shout out to librarians. Um, so does anybody have any questions that they or comments that they would like to bring, bring to our presenters? I really like that you included a section on what the faculty do, because um, in my work with first year students, I find that students often don't understand what faculty are. Um, mm -hmm. They think of them like as super high school teachers and they don't get like, they're doing research. Well, we're trying to teach them some um, oral history skills. So oral history interviews. And so we're gonna work in class with our chapter on oral history and links to the sorts of questions you want to do. And then to have practice, I figured that I would send them out to all the faculty because they aren't, most of them have just transferred in and they really don't know the names that go next to the, uh, you know, the course schedule and who they're signing up for or what they might be interested in. And so we haven't developed the questions yet because we haven't hit that unit yet in class, but then I'm gonna send them out. I've been warning the faculty that they're gonna have transfer students all coming to 
to talk to them. And that is going to go into the into the uh, their handbook that's going to go with this OER. That sounds excellent. And a really great, great way of circumventing the, I find transfer students are often very frustrated that they feel like they have to sit through yet another orientation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like sidesteps that it seems. Very great. Um, anyone else have any questions or comments? I really appreciate the honesty of this um, presentation because <laughs> sometimes, because it, it, it can be a really frustrating process. So I appreciate that. Well, because we had heard from everyone else who had done this, that it was easy and straightforward. So we just kind of waltzed into this thinking, no problem. We have all the skills. We know what we want in this class. And then it, it was a train wreck. So, but it's not a train wreck anymore. It's, 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 we, we are very proud of it now. But I would say that piloting it and letting people who aren't involved in it, the instructors and the students was extremely important because we thought, you know, and Stephanie in particular, when she came in and did this yeoman's work, that we had it. And then we realized, oh, they wanted a little bit more information. These questions were asked more. And so we added some um, extra materials, not a lot, but just here or there where it was needed because these were consistent comments of where they wanted more information. So that was very useful to pilot it too. So we are at time. Um, so I would love for everybody to use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen to give all of our presenters uh, a clap reaction. Um, if people want to hang out and chat more, you're welcome to do that for 10, 15 minutes. I can keep the room open. Uh, otherwise, uh, great job to all of our presenters. Thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see a bunch of you tomorrow and Friday. Thanks y'all. Anna, um, with, with these sessions recorded, um, do you know where they're